Hello, I'm Mike, and this is the Tube Computer. It's an 8-bit general purpose computer intended for the whole family to use. Currently, its input is connected to the airship flight sim control panel to the right, and its output to the mechanical display in the centre. Judy has just pointed out to me we don't have smello vision here, we only have these moving pictures. So sadly what you can't appreciate is the pleasant homely aroma from the hundreds of vacuum tubes quietly burning off their dust. At present, the two computers are running a test program into these seven segment mechanical displays. They're recycled from old British Rail Station clocks. I used to see and hear them every day at Victoria Railway Station where they made a lovely sound. I would often leave work after midnight and in an empty Victoria station the sound of the clocks was very reassuring. I bought a load of these when British Rail decommissioned the clocks in the late 1990s. Anyway, let me show you how it all goes together. I'll switch it off, make it safe and take you on the guided tour. In passing, you might have realised from the complete lack of technical pros that unfortunately I taught myself electronics from data sheets and experiment, which is definitely not the best way. Over the years I could have produced far better kit had I studied electronics at school. And it could have led to a really interesting career, so if you do get the chance to study, please go for it. I think the shutdown's getting there. I always check the HT just in case. That's great, all is safe. Now let's start at the top, and yes, you do need a stepladder to work on the tube computer. <laughs> it's built from several hundred 6N3P dual triode tubes, recycled from back in the 1950s and 60s. And just like the IBM 700 and its contemporaries, these tubes are combined with germanium diodes to produce all the logic in the computer. So here we have the combined input, output and status boards. The next down is the ALU carry forward register. This enables the tube computer to do 16-bit maths by holding the bit 7 carry value. Then we have the board that puts the memory address register onto the data bus during the fetch sequence. I'm, I'm sure there's a correct technical name for it, anyway. Then the four boards of the memory address register itself and a similar four for the program counter and then the NVRAM. Each group of four boards contains eight memory registers. Uh, the program counter here is unusual. To reduce the tube count, it's incremented by the ALU rather than having a dedicated adder. This does make for a much longer instruction cycle. And from what I can gather, it seems an unusual approach, and I may be in a minority of one to think of it as a good idea. Moving down to the control backplane, in the centre is a modern display console. It's not part of the function of the tube computer really, it simply monitors what it does. Being an old geek, I not only wanted the tube computer to run useful software for the grandchildren, I also wanted to see how the program actually ran, just for me. At the top of the control backplane, we have the boards that generate the not data. The tube computer is slightly unusual in that it has two complementary data buses. This again is purely to reduce the tube count. The first gate in all the 50 or so memory registers would normally be a data not gate. So by using a complementary data bus, each register requires one less gate. The downside of this approach is that it makes the registers far more critical to set up, with levels just all over the place, and a total confusion for the poor old console display. Then there's the two boards for the instruction register, all the other registers in the tube computer are 8 bits, except for the instruction register, which is just 4, as there's only 16 instructions. These two boards here also have a secondary function. Along with two sets of test points at the base of the control backplane, they can be used to set up a 10 NOR gate or to tweak up a register's memory function. Then to the right, we have the external memory, the vacuum tube RAM and its address decoder, and to the left, the clock system with the oscillator, buffers, binary counters, and also the decoder. The ring oscillator's output is buffered several times to square up the signal, which then feeds the three-stage binary counters. The oscillator can be isolated, so you can manually generate pulses to step through parts of a program, which is quite fun. Uh, the outputs of the three binary counters are decoded here to deliver the control pulses for the instruction cycle. 
The clock system does require tweaking occasionally and the tubes of the binary counters do need to be chosen with reasonably matched parameters. I've added a resistor and capacitor to each stage of the ring oscillator just to slow it down a bit. You can jump at the capacitor values to change the oscillator frequency here. And you can also change the relative phase of the clock to the microcode load pulses. This adds a bit of stability basically to the whole system. Below these two arms are the instruction decoder boards and the microcode ROM matrix. These four boards link together with the instruction register to generate the microcode. The decoder first takes the instruction register outputs and generates one of 16 possible execute signals. Then during the final part of the instruction cycle, the ROM matrix buffers the single execute signal to produce the microcode. This section here is where you can manually step through the instruction cycle. There are six fetch and a single execute cycle, after which follows an unused clock period. In a previous system, I used this final clock period for a second execute instruction. I trimmed this down to a single execute simply to reduce the tube count. I should also point out that the tube computer does not have any form of instruction pipeline and the fetch execute cycle is carried out progressively so that every instruction is completed before the next is started. Then it's down to the ALU backplane with the four boards of the accumulator and four more for the memory buffer register. Again, both 8-bit. And then the lower eight boards are all for the arithmetic logic unit. I designed this ALU to only generate the five functions needed by the instructions. That is sum, carry, not, increment, and xnor. Using a combination of these instructions, you can produce subtract, decrement, and xor. You could design a far more complex ALU, but these are the only functions the two computer actually needs. Each ALU bit produces a carry, which goes to the next higher bit in a ripple fashion. With clock speeds of just a few kilohertz, this is quite adequate and does not cause any timing issues at all. Now let me show you how these 10 tube modules go together. Here, as I say, is one I made earlier. I've built several versions of the 10 tube modules, but all contain the same basic NOR gate circuits. As you know, current practice is to logically place the components around the board to simplify the routing. But the original way, as used on vacuum tube computer modules back in the 1950s, was to place all the components under the tube base. With the tube computer, I've tried to build a modern interpretation of this design philosophy. There's only a little space under a ceramic tube socket, and everything gets a bit tight. But keeping the HT below 100 volts enables much smaller and closer components. These here are the germanium diodes, these are resistors, and at the back, the bypass capacitor. After soldering, I encase the components for both stability and safety. Each module actually needs around 3.6 amps for the 10 heaters, and so I have to split this current down to an amp or so between several pins on the 50-way connector. You still need to give the heater current enough track width, and on this board, the heater tracks are all 1.2 millimeters wide and they operate as a ring main. It spreads out the load a bit. This is part of an earlier board with a single half millimeter track width, which simply blew out. On a previous system, I placed the main distribution heater tracks at the top. They were 17.5 millimeters wide, and with just two power connectors per board, it needed 30 amp installation cable to feed it. This time I've reduced the heater tracks to a 5mm pair down each side of all the back planes. Then increase the number of power connectors so that each cable supplies an average of just four boards. And now I can use normal domestic power cable. Uh, this is actually the ALU back plane board from the bottom of the tube computer. I just also want to show you the quality of the tube computer signals. They're not quite textbook. This is the oscillator output, and you can see why it needs buffering to square it up. <laughs> I don't think the binary counters could cope with this. And um, this is an oscilloscope image of one of the accumulator register outputs. No lovely square edges and loads of crosstalk, but it's good enough. And these are quite useful test points for the oscilloscope 
And this is a very useful tweaker that my mate Dave gave me. Now down on the floor are the power supplies. These are the four heater PSUs. They're based on standard cheap and cheerful off the shelf devices. There's an excellent website by Lindsay Wilson describing useful mods for these. They don't look much, but together they can deliver a mighty 280 amps to the tube heaters. This is quite enough when the heaters are warm, but unfortunately when cold, the resistance is less than half of the working value. Luckily, these cheap and cheerful power supplies have a simple but effective current limiting system that kicks in during the tube warm up period. I also reduce this initial current surge by starting the heaters at a very low voltage, around 4.5 volts. I then crank it up after a minute or so to 6.3 volts when the tubes are warm and the heater resistance has finally doubled to its working value, which is around about 18 ohms. Then to the left are the HT supplies, sourced from two identical buck boost converters at plus 80 and minus 30 volts. These converters are actually much larger than they need be. They're simply recycled from a previous project. And thirdly, the auxiliary supplies, 5 volts for the console and 12 volts for the mechanical display. It all makes for a very warm and cosy computer room. After the warm-up, when the 50 or so registers settle, they're all in random states, so they need to be set to zero. A couple of lines of code can do this, or you can simply press this button. It does take 10 or 15 minutes for the computer to stabilise for a final tweak. Thermal stability just takes a long time. I think of this simply in terms of a rather long boot up sequence like the old 286 computers attempting to boot Windows 3.1. <laughs> anyway, it's been fun to make. Thanks for watching this. Bye.